Okay, I'm going to resume looking uh, briefly at crowdsourcing and its relationship to official, official data in MSDI. Um, you've already heard this morning about JEBCO, which was initiated back in 1903, and it's been collecting data uh, from both hydrographic research ships and some vessels of opportunity since then. It's now jointly overseen by IHO and uh, the UNESCO office, by the IOC here. It's got depth measurements from vessels uh, as they cross the ocean. They join the system. There are some standards we'll look at in a minute that they're supposed to follow. Um, however, as you'll notice, the statistic I got, this was like yesterday, less than 15% of the world's ocean depths have been directly measured since 1903. So there's still a, there's a lot of ocean out there that we don't know anything about. There's a lot that we probably don't need to know about, but it would be nice if we did especially since a lot of the bathymetric readings are a century old or more, even on official maps from Admiralty PLC in the UK. Some of these things are from trips in the 1800s that were never really updated because nobody saw the need to. So the IHO was approached to get involved with uh, crowdsourcing, and they have formed uh, a crowdsourced bathymetry working group, which came out with, uh, they're called draft, it's a draft guidance document on crowdsourced bathymetry, but it's not going to change. Um, our MSDI working group liaises with them. Uh, it, everything has to be drafted until it's agreed by the whole council at the IHO, which is why even the publication C-17 on marine SDI, guidance for hydrographic offices from the hydrographic service from IHO, was basically written something like first draft five years ago, final draft over two years ago, and was finally released in January because everything has to be approved by the council. And you've got 120 some states or members of the IHO. So things take a long time. One of the benefits of being involved in the IHO at the working group side, and anybody can join the expert group if, they, if you have reasonable credentials, is you get access to a lot of information you don't get otherwise because you get directed to the, to the shared documents you're working on. But this is a probably totally indiscernible map showing the extent of publicly available bathymetric data <coughs> came out of an article written by the Secretary General of the IHO MDSI Working Group. So you get some idea of the amount of tracks that are being followed. Of course, when they tie into the big cruise, cruise ships, sounds excellent, but the cruise ships tend to follow the same tracks most of the time. And after you've done you know, New York to the Caribbean uh, to northern Venezuela and back six times, you probably don't really need that track data anymore. And that's why we needed to spread it more widely. There is a, an exercise here in, the, in Europe that was started from an EC-funded project, an EU-funded project that must be at least 10 years ago now, where you can join. They give you the specifications to use the data sounder and the um, equipment on your own personal uh, boat. We have about 20 boats on the system up at the sailing club in Zeruga. So you can actually collect data and feed it back into their system, a bit like the um, ocean map, the, the free ocean map. The problem is there, again, um, we tend to go to the same places. I mean, you don't, you only have an afternoon or a day to go sailing, so you sail out a bit, you turn left to right, sail back again. And after you've done that, 15 times, and 20 boats have done it. They don't need any more of that data either, except on a, on a changing basis. So there's something, to, uh, there's a problem, it's not a problem. It's an issue with crowdsourced data, is managing the data. Now, if you're part of the IHO uh, initiative, they've got a thing called the Data, D data Center for Digital Bathymetry, um, and they have a, what they call trusted nodes. And you can click on these links uh, later on on your presentations online, which takes you off to the website, which says what a trusted node is. And it tends to be mainly some of the larger shipping vessels um, and the cruise liners and a few of the smaller, uh, what I call, pleasure craft. And they go through the, this trusted node process, which we'll see in a second, and they feed into the uh, digital bathymetry database. <coughs> So this just shows how the system works. You're a trusted node. You feed, it, you feed your information into the web. It's ingested. Uh, it's checked. It goes into, this, into the database. And then it can be accessed if you go to the online system, which is hosted, I believe, right now by NOAA. I'll have to go back and check that. The actual database itself is hosted by one of the, one of the big national uh, hydrographic services. Um, this is the data viewer. 
So it's it's limited data. I mean, you can you can get information on passages, you can get information on channels that you might have that you might want to go through, but it certainly isn't massive coverage yet. They're hoping to get a lot more. But if you're a trusted node, they require this is the sort of data you have to report if you want to feed into their system. So it may be crowdsourced, but it's it's verified in this sense that if you can't provide the data they've suggested beforehand when you join the the so-called system, then they won't they won't accept it. So this is the basic that longitude, latitude, depth, the date and time stamp, and the course over the ground. Well, that's perfect. That makes perfect sense. Then the requested metadata is all of this. The vessel type, name, length, blah, 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 sounder model, uh, the GNSS model, the sensor type you're using. So there's quite a lot of data. This is collected automatically through software you can actually put on your boat, <coughs> which will feed from your depth sounder and, and even into your uh, uh, radio systems. If you're a trusted node, what they call a trusted node, which makes it more official crowdsourced data, you then have to put in this extra information on your vessel ID, uh, the convention you're sending under, logger information uh, for the software, the version you're using, etc. But it's not, it's not overkill. I mean, you could set this up. We set up a system on our sailboat uh, about four years ago. It took about, you know, three hours to actually make all the connections on board as well. Um, the problem with crowdsourced data, and it's a similar problem with, with real data, <coughs> is the uncertainty that creeps in. A uh, typical example here was this one on the right where you're in a pleasure craft, you've got a, a depth sounder, and you're going along, and all of a sudden you see the ocean's risen up, you know, quite a bit from the bottom. In fact, what you're looking at is a huge mass of fish you know, swimming by, and if you went by there again 10 minutes later, it wouldn't be there. You've also got the problem with taking readings that the boat is in motion, unless you've got a system that can really handle you know, the motion aspect, then you can be getting a false reading. But it's not going to be false by too much. It's probably better than having no data at all for that area, where there are still lots of places with very little data. So that's, that's part of it. Um, there are also legal considerations if you're using the, the crowdsourced bathymetry of the IHO. You have to have permission to collect that sort of data from your government. You don't want to try to do this in India off the coast of India, because they take a dim view of people collecting information like this, unless it's well known by the Indian government for, for uh, home defense purposes. Um, like we were prevented from taking handheld GPS devices into Egypt a few years ago. We were working on their SDI for rural cadaster. It was not allowed to take a, GP, um, a handheld GPS device into Egypt. You had to get it through an official source, so they knew that you had one. And part of that was fear of mapping, you know, getting very high precision data that they didn't know who had the data. So there's, there's things that, and you have to be conditioned where are the conditions of the licensing regime, um, which may exist. Again, this varies from state to, from country to country. And when you're publishing the data, this isn't for you to worry about. It's for the users. Is the data I've collected fit for purpose? This applies to all the data in spatial data infrastructure and lots of other databases. I collect the data to do road transport planning in a county in England, you know, and it has a certain accuracy for the center line. Somebody else comes along and wants to use that to place sensors down for automatic car driving or something. So you've got to make sure that the quality and, and the uh, quality of the data you're collecting and the coverage that you're collecting is actually good for your purpose because so much data is misused. It was another reason. It's still a reason this quote is sometimes why people don't want to harmonize data and make it more widely available because they're afraid of misuse. And especially we've seen this in the commission funded projects <coughs> projects for um, creating these new applications where you might be using five or ten different data sources. Some of them are quite good, some are quite accurate, uh, some were never intended to be used for what the application is looking at doing. But it's there, so let's use it. And when you buy one of these applications or get it for free, you know, download one of your 500 apps on your smartphone or your, or your GPS device, you never really know unless you actually read all of the background documentation. It's like reading the OEM agreement every time you log on to a new piece of software. How many of you have read the OEM agreement you've agreed to for using Word or PowerPoint or any GS, GS, uh, GIS package? After page 30, most people get fed up and stop reading. But that's the, that's the level of information you might need about the data before you use it for an application. So now let's get on to the, to the better part and look at some, uh, some SDI, marine SDI activities that have taken place. Australia had the uh, Australian marine system of, what is this? I can't think of the name again. It's on the next one. All I ever know it as AMSIS. 
because I can't remember what it stands for. This, um, the, li the link is there. It's worth exploring the link. I've got a couple of screenshots here, but it's worth exploring the link to see what they've done. This has a lot of legacy data in it from a previous system that was then migrated to the AMSIS. It has interactive maps for several applications. It all comes under Geoscience Australia, which is their national SDI initiative. So it's not separated from that sense. <clears throat> and this is also, it's a good thing, and it's also what's happening more, more regularly now. You don't have the marine SDI. You have the marine component of the SDI, of the national SDI, where they put more emphasis on the marine coastal data. But if you go and have a, a view of the interactive maps, these are the sorts of things they have. Um, the Ocean Governance and Regulated Le Legislation Information, Se Seas and Submerged Lands Act. Can I go further? I can't go further. There's about five or six systems. Well, uh, fisher fisheries-related uh, uh, charts. When we get to Canada, we'll see that they also have tools you can download, geo tools they've developed, um, assessment mechanisms. So they put a lot more work into the, this is the Atlantic side of Canada. I wanted to do the coastal U.S. first, partly because it was one of the earliest developed. The Coastal Services Center um, was set up in the mid-90s, I guess. They actually had published coastal national spatial data infrastructure documents back in 1999, I say five years before the president even, even came up with the SDI initiative. <clears throat> so coastal was being well looked after. Um, yeah, but it's, it's uh, governed by the Federal, Ge Federal Geographic Data Committee as far as the governance side went. It's operated by the Office for Coastal Management under NOAA. And the FGDC is not only involved in, in running the, um, sub work, the subcommittee for the Marine and Coastal SDI, as we saw in that earlier diagram of the Greek building, um, they also sit on two or three of the other subcommittees to do with geology and other things, because these also have an effect on coastal, coastal zones. So again, there's the limit. There's the, I'm not going to go to that now. I might want to go to one later. Um, so we have the Coastal SDI. It's called Digital Coast. It's a great example to try to accede to simply because of the number of partners they have. Now, Claudia, if I link, click on the link, am I going to lose everything? Okay. Whoops. Because usually I lose everything when I do this. Here's what makes this such a success. <clears throat> In a lot of places, you're lucky to get 50, people, 50 organizations contributing to the SDI or the Marine SDI. In, this, in the digital coast, they have, hang on, I've forgotten how to use a Mac. Is it two fingers or one, two fingers? You've got partners from the state level, academia, counties, cities, federal, non-governmental, and private. There's over 450 partners contributing to the SDI. Okay, right now we're just looking at, at state. And that makes a difference. They're all contributing their data. They're, they're, they're following the standards where they exist. And they're building up a huge resource that is extremely well used. It's, a, it's one of the most heavily uh, accessed websites in the states for anything to do with, with coastal activity. But it wouldn't have that success unless it had this voluntary input coming in from these other organizations. Now, the federal, the federal data, they are required to submit their data and their metadata under the Freedom of Information Act, 1976. That only applies to federal data or projects, maybe state level projects with federal funding. So again, huge, huge bits of data isn't going to come from, you know, from the government. These are all cities. Federal coming in. What do we have for counties? We've got 3,000 counties and not, you know, not, all, not all coastal. <coughs> There's 3,000 counties all together. So you've got all these different counties in the coastal states participating in this, contributing and using the data. And the more people you have participating, the more you learn about what you need in your SDI because you're getting real fit. Well, why can't it do this? Oh, we have that. Maybe we could give you that. So that makes a, a big difference there. No. So that's one of the key aspects in any SDI, but certainly in the marine world, is getting the, uh, getting the partners involved. Why isn't it going ahead, Claudia? This is why I never. This is why I never go off to the other links. <laughs> it, won't, it won't move. Oh, it didn't before. You had to move that first. That was interesting. Okay.
right? Thank you. <coughs> Technology. Um, this is just a background on the digital coast. Again, every one of these is a hot link, so you can go explore what they've got there, especially on the, um, the stories from the field. It's what people are doing with this. If you need to, to bring this concept into your own organization, to your own countries, you can see some of the ad hoc stories as to how useful they found this to be. And then they have the products as well. Uh, different data sets, land cover data. Again, we're talking about coastal land cover is important for, for stuff near coast. You've got runoff, you've got transport runoff from road systems, you've got fertilizer runoff. So there's lots of different things involved. And it's good to have a look at that. Now, we mentioned the Canadian Marine GDI. <clears throat> this is the one that actually developed its own specification, quite a detailed document, you know, 80 or 90 pages, uh, stating what should be in the marine geospatial data infrastructure. And back in 1999, their own, and the user requirements came out in 2001, the actual national GDI, the Canadian GDI, was only published, the guidelines were only published in 2004, five years later. So it's another case where the marine community was moving ahead. They were moving faster. Um, and we've had a meeting uh, within the Coast GIS Conference, which is, uh, we have a heavy participation from Canada and in the ICANN, International Coastal Atlas Network. We found this, uh, challenge, this statement of challenges 14 years ago. Capacity building will be needed to create demand for MGDI and to create the capacity to use MGDI to the fullest. And that statement is just as applicable today and has been quoted, I think, at every GS, Coast GIS conference since then, which means you still have to concentrate on the capacity building to get people to use the data once you've created it and harmonized it. Um, a lot of people don't want to think about that. Now, in Canada, GeoConnections is the, is the national uh, SDI um, under which some of these marine activities take place. And they're also working on the Arctic SDI, which was also mentioned this morning. I'm not, you can click on these links to go have a visit of those. They've got web map services uh, from Natural Resources Canada who run this. From the coastal side, it's basically Cohen Atlantic. Uh, the Atlantic Coastal Zone Information Steering Committee has done a lot of work on the Atlantic coast, there's virtually nothing on the on the western coast, over the you know, Vancouver side, etc. Partly because it's so poorly populated. I mean, there's mainly forest land. There isn't even, as I found out, I used to go to big conferences in Vancouver every year, GIS conferences, and we took a week off at the end of my wife and I. We were going to drive up the coast. There's no road that goes up the west coast of Canada. You end up driving through a forest about 50 miles. Oops about 50 miles from the coast because it's all, it's all logs. It's just all logging taking place. Tremendous amount of orca research taking place, but not much in the way of, uh, of coastal tourism. But so a lot of work has been done in Cohen Atlantic. And one of the handouts you have here is something they've developed, which we'll have a quick look at towards the end. I want you to take it away. It is, it is on the website to download. So you can have a feeling for what's been developed in that area. They've done some really good work. On their website, They've got the uh, search utility. They've got a geo content generator. Uh, they've got this data accessibility self-assessment tool, which is what I, was, what I was going to use as a handout, which is on the list. Basically, it's a document they've developed over about three years to take away, to answer questions, how well are we, how ready are we for accessibility of our data? This is the marine data. And the first time I think Andy presented this was probably in Cape Town, 2012, 13. And it's been modified since. Each time they use it, when he makes a presentation, we try to make it better. So I'm not sure if this is still pointing to the most recent one or not. I would have to check on that. But it's these sorts of activities that you do to spread information, to get people involved, to find out how ready you are, to try to assess how much work you still have to do. So from their website, you can look at the characterization service for the island of Newfoundland. You've got the search utility tools, the geo content uh, generator tool. So you've actually got things to help you create data to put into the system uh, following the standards. Um, and this is what makes it more useful to people, not just here's the data. I probably shouldn't say this, but we had a thing here called the African Ocean, what was the African database called? Odin Africa? We had the big database of 800 data resources from Africa. Yeah. And then, and then we started looking at how often any of the data is being used, and it wasn't too good. So it's not much sense in wasting a lot of time and money building big databases unless you're also monitoring who's using them or who's not using them, and then finding out why they're not using them. Is it still big? Sorry?
Oh no! Well, one one thing is simply access to the you know using using online Google tools to access how often the database even been accessed. We did that ourselves within the GSDI Association. We had a thing called the Spatial Documents Depot. In the end, it had about 90 documents in it on SDI. Um, and then the man who had been looking after it, he retired, and he quit being the Secretary General. I was supposed to take over. I finally went and looked on our own database how many times these documents had been accessed. Three or four of them had been accessed two or three hundred times. About 90% of them had been accessed either zero times or one or two times. And that was usually me checking if they were still in the database. And yet we were trying to encourage people to submit all these documents to us. And part of the problem there was promoting it. We, did, we didn't promote it well enough to a wide community to say these documents all exist in one place. They relate specifically to different aspects of spatial data infrastructure globally. You know, the African SDI cookbook. The, we've got a Mongolian SDI cookbook. The Albanian SDI cookbook. We have all these things up there. But unless people are made aware of them, people might want to use them. It doesn't do much good. And this is the case in Ireland, where we started uh, the Irish Spatial Data Exchange, started with the Marine Institute, Geological Survey of Ireland, and the Coastal Marine Research Center, um, the Department of Environment, Community, Local Government, which now has a different name because they changed the name of that department about once a year. But they, they, to see, they weren't all like marine. They were from different areas. But they realized, because coastline is very important in Ireland, fishing is very important in Ireland, um, that they had to work together. So the community got together basically working through the Marine Institute in Dublin and, and uh, on the West Coast in Galway. And they developed an entire system. They developed standards. They, they adopted standards. They ran training courses. They got people feeding information into the ISDE. And it was nearly all open access, which was the good thing about it, because they weren't, they weren't selling their data, most of it at that time, except for, except for the mapping, the underlying topographic data. Ordnance Survey Ireland was, was following the lead of Ordnance Survey Great Britain, and they charged for mapping data. Um, so we ran this study, and there's a link to the study on the, on the website, uh, on the course website, to download the study. This was a PhD project, or PhD, that came out of the uh, University of Brest uh, with uh, Jade Quivaris, um, and I worked on it, and Hugh Cromfoots from you know, K K KUL, Catholic University of Louvain, where Jade was doing her PhD. She started back in 14 and 15. We updated it once in 16. She went online to start looking at geo portals. You know, what exists out there? What are the data policies? Who's presenting these things? What are the access policies? Because nobody had ever done this before in the brain world that we could find. And this was the first part of her PhD. Has anybody done this? Um, and especially for data in the coastal zone. So she started doing this online inventory in October 2014, working up to her PhD. She revisited the portals in 2015, and I've revisited most of them again, although I haven't updated uh, the report because we're, we're putting it together as a research paper in 2016. One thing we have noted is that the change hasn't been all that dynamic over a period of three years. How many new portals have come online? How much data is better than it was before? Um, how much more information is there on data policy? Because it's great to create a portal. But if you don't manage the portal, if you don't manage the web portal and, and deal with the stakeholders, um, at the end of the day, you start to wonder how, ask how much of it is being used, which is the real key. But part of Jade's research was to try to find a way to characterize different geo portals. Uh, so she came up, having visited them all, uh, the fir uh, a first pass, she came up with these 20 characteristics that she was looking for. <clears throat> Seven characteristics had to do with discovery online. And this led to this typology that we'll look at in a second. You know, what type of geo portal is your geo portal? And then the 13 characteristics dealing with the five SDI components. So she visited 120 geo portals during the research. 57% were included in the survey. 23% were considered out of scope of the survey, partly because of uh, data restrictions or access restrictions, so we couldn't even really use them. You would have had to get a license or something. And 20% were there, but non-operational. I mean, it's there, the website exists, but nothing happens when you go there. So this, again, is somebody has invested money and time in creating a portal and then not followed through and actually delivered on use of the portal. Um, this was the geographic distribution. This wasn't restricted just to Europe. Um, and this is the number of geo portals. You'll see the biggest number is in um, USA uh, and France. They have a lot of, they had 
let's say, at least five or six portals for geo, you know, marine geospatial data. Most of them only had one. Some of them had two. So again, this hasn't been a big initiative from the marine SDI side. We're still at very early days in creating comprehensive marine SDIs. In other words, the marine component within an SDI. And whether, the, whether a geo portal exists or not is a good example of that, is a good parameter. Because if the portal's not there, then that means either the data's not there or even the discovery service is not there, so you can't find out the data. So she developed this typology. Basically, the portals fell into four categories. They were either uh, NODCs, they were atlas-like geoportals from the work we've, we've done with the ICANN uh, International Coastal Atlas Project. Uh, they were hydrographic office official geoportals, or they were hybrids of the two. And it's a reasonably even split across the board for the, the portals that she actually visited. This was the number she was able to actually go to and get information from and who the affiliation were at the time. ICANN was the main affiliation for the atlas-like portals. Uh, NODCs came out of uh, IOC, and we had the hydrographic office portals. The characteristics she looked at were, were these, you know, the portal, the data themes, the number of data sets, how open it is, is licensing required, um, how many users do they report, how many data suppliers do they report, are they using standard metadata? Because if you were going to start using somebody else's geo portal, this is what you would want to know. This is the sort of metadata you should have about the portal. Forget about the databases. You have to know something about the portal itself. Um, and you see, again, most of these only started to be implemented. And there was a big surge around 25, 2005 and 6. Um, Atlas-like portals, thanks to ICANN, I think, kept going reasonably well uh, up into 2011. Um, 2013, we had the hydrographic offices, you know, being being more accessible. I won't go through all the rest of these stats. They're there for you to look at if you want. Uh, this is the number of data sets. Again, the hydrographic offices you know, have a huge number of data sets available um, because officially they have to in this part of their job. Whereas some of the um, NODCs were actually lower, had lower representation than I would have thought. So. These are the data themes, whether it's administrative data, physical data, biological data, or human data. And again, the Atlas-like portals uh, are superb because they have a wide group of people participating in the atlases. Now, some are done at state level, some are done at community level. So you get a lot of different coverage from a, from a coastal atlas. The data suppliers, of course, the, the peak there was the hydrographic offices because we were able to get information that we wanted from 18 hydrographic offices. So they were they were a big bridge. The other was the NODCs. Again, they're required. So we had access to those. Whether it was a catalog search, a map search, or a list search, in other words, using uh, um, search word keywords, uh, mapping searches, uh, and catalogs were, were the biggest users. Access mechanisms, view only, certainly. A lot of, a lot of view only, um, less download, less direct access. Um, buying from a, what we call a cart, a shopping cart, or buying through a distribution agent, that's where most of the hydrographic office data comes from. Because a lot of them still, even if they don't charge for data, they want to know who's using the data, which actually helps make, helps produce better data. If you just give data away for free, anybody can come and download it and use it. You don't learn anything about that, except that a lot of people used your data. I ran a, a training course for the CGIAR, the U.S. Geological Survey in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 2002. And America at that time and now, all of the Landsat data, completely freely downloadable. I mean, we were talking satellite systems that have been up there since 1960. They took us in the basement of this several acre building with air conditioned basement, thousands and thousands of tapes, film. You know, film canisters this big, they used to take the film and eject it from the spacecraft and collect it down below, which has all been digitized. They spend millions on this. And Mr. Thompson, who was in charge of the facility, uh, ESA had, had come along and it was making data available from the Sentinel satellites, etc. But to get data from the European system, you had to apply for the data, say what you were going to use it for, do something with it. And then if you develop the new product or service, they actually held joint copyright on that for 18 months. And then it reverted completely to you. So yes, it, and you had to pay some ridiculously low price for all the data you needed, like you know, 200 euro for you know, 10 years worth of data. Uh, it, you know, it would, they could only send to you on digital tapes, you know, these big that stacks. So the cost wasn't a problem. 
but you did have to register and use it and do something with it. He thought that was a fantastic system because he could point to statistics, which he did on their computer. We've had 2.8 million downloads of data in the last three months. I have no idea what anybody did with that. I have no idea if it was any good. I don't know what they used it for. I don't know if it was suited for purpose. I have no information except we had 2.8 million downloads of our data. And he said he would actually favor, which is against the law apparently for federal data, he would favor a registration system. So people did have to register to download it and then feed him back some information. Not just register that this organization downloaded the data, but what did you do with it? What was wrong with it? How could we have made it better? So you do have to have some level of control, even if you're not charging for the data afterwards. It's a good thing to think about when everybody's going about completely open data, just download anything you want. Well, it's great, except you may be using it for the wrong purpose, and the people you downloaded it from may not know how you use it and could make it better if they did. Again, the, the level of openness, completely free data, the best was from the, the atlases. There are some um, hydrographic offices, I think Scandinavia mainly, that make their data freely available, but most of that is, is for a fee. ISO, or IHO with the S57 standard, don't forget when we did this study, and even today, um, it's the S57 navigational uh, standard, and, and now the new standards for uh, navigational charts, electronic naviga nautical charts. So they've always worked to a standard system. The NODCs are working with standards that have been developed mainly here in, in IOC over the years. Um, so there's a lot of standardization taking place there. So of the Atlas-like geoportals, Open license or a specific data user agreement applied 78% of the times. The hydrographic geoportals, we're talking hydrographic offices, typically it was under these conditions of sale, which for the most part, uh, that bar on the right-hand side, you actually had to enter into an agreement to get the data. Even in cases where you didn't have to pay for it, you had to have an agreement for it. And then the NODC data portal, data geoportals, as we saw back here, they were uh, free. They were really mostly free. Okay, so what about geoportals? Basically, work is taking place. There are portals out there. There are portals with hundreds of data sets in them. Um, but there wasn't much evidence in the growth of the marine geoportal business, if you want to call it that, over the three years that we've looked at this. If you go back and do the same sort of online searching to find new portals, they just aren't there. In fact, some of the ones that were there before aren't there anymore or certainly aren't managed anymore. They were put up probably with project funding. You got three years of project funding, uh, whether it was EU funded or you know, local government, and you put your geo portal together, uh, you wrote some user manuals, you ran some training courses, and when the funding ran out, it disappeared. Or at, the, or at the best, it still exists in whatever state it was in when you finished, but nothing's ever happened to it since. And that is something that you really, I, I don't understand why the funding bodies don't demand more on that side. If we're going to give you X million euro to do something, prove to us that it's going to exist afterwards. Certainly in SDI, generally over here, that has become more of the case now. When you finish a project, you've ended up building some big portal. I know the Atlantic uh, Ocean Observing System, Atlantos, this 20 million euro project with 62 members. Part of that project is that, I think it's the um, uh, Kiel, Germany, it's the GeoMars Center, have agreed to keep everything online and updated for the next five years, or at least to keep the website active. So then they can also then apply for more funding. Because if you're not going to keep it active, why should we give you more funding? Um, so, and we also found that access to the wide range of marine data uh, for, for the application that are being developed in the coastal zone was not all that frequent. Because it's a matter of not just downloading. Once you download an application, you lose control of who's using it. How many time, How many people use the app? You know, you could download one app, put it on a computer, and send it to the field of 25 engineers or 25 research students, but you don't have any idea for that. So we're trying to find a way to get that sort of feedback as well, to build up a better picture of how, we're, of how SDI is working in the marine community, because that's the community we're trying to, to push now. The marine community, coastal community, has been a leader in SDI development, as we saw in Canada, Australia, uh, USA, long before the topographic people ever got on board. But now we have to find a way to, to, to push that onwards. And the main lesson is there's still need for this true data harmonization and services interoperability. And the whole point, if you see behind Inspire and other SDI initiatives, <coughs> Inspire is only 50% about data, harmonizing metadata and harmonizing data. The rest is harmonizing the services to access the data and, and monitoring the performance of those services. There are response time requirements in the regulation. 
you know, if, you've, if you're providing a national data set, uh, an Inspire compliant national data set in Spain or France or Germany, and people launch um, requests to it, it has to respond within a certain number of seconds or microseconds. So you need to monitor the whole system, not just the data. So a quick uh, look, we're getting to the end of IHO. Um, the, the Marine SDI Working Group was actually formed at the IHO, I think as far back as 2007 or 2008. We had a couple of meetings. Denmark was, was, the, was the secretariat, and they still are today. But then everybody sort of lost impetus, and not much happened for about three years. And I'm not sure exactly what the, the spur was to get everything moving again <coughs> three years ago. But now it's become quite an active work, uh, user group. I think it was. Because of the SDI developments, the marine community, especially the hydrographic offices, who had been almost totally left out of the whole NSDI development process in marine countries, in coastal countries. Now, all of a sudden, somebody thought about the, the hydrographic people. You know, maybe the coastline might be important. So they started, they got more interest in being included. That was part of the driver. Um, we do an annual work plan, which we try to finish. It's all volunteer. <coughs> we get close each year. It's a three-year work plan. It's a rolling work plan. I'm now working on a contribution on data policy and on training. Um, it has both Government agencies and hydrographic offices. There are three or four independent experts. Um, Esri is a member. Uh, Karis, who are now Teledyne, who do the marine GIS package. They're members, very active members. And the OGC is a member. We also share work with the Open Geospatial Consortium Marine Domain Working Group, which I'll show in a minute. But so far, the, the real work coming out of OGC is just tied into the IHO work. On the specific annual work plans, people's and names and organization names are against the activities to be produced. A lot of it has to do with communication. Um, I was asked to develop a communication plan for the conference we held this year in Brazil, but I didn't make it, so I'm still working on my communication plan. <clears throat> We're trying to find ways from the experiences we learned in Europe with Inspire, there wasn't enough communication. The fact that I can meet people today who work in what should be the SDI community in Europe at government level, and they still never heard of Inspire. And it's been law since 2009 in every member state. Uh, we have major EC regulations that have all been in place, some as long as 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago. Uh, even the latest out been in 2013 or 2015, and yet they never even heard of the initiative, which legally they're supposed to be following by EU law. So we have a lot to do on the communication side. We meet once a year at different places, uh, Japan, North Korea, London. Uh, last year, uh, two years ago, it was in Vancouver. Last year, it was in Brazil. Um, unfortunately, I missed that one, so it would have been better than London, I think. And then we have lots of interim meetings with, with activities within the working group that we held through, um, online, through WebEx uh, on the system. People can join these meetings if you want to join one of the meetings as, as an observer just to see what's going on, especially if you have any interest in the hydrographic organization side of the activity. You let the, one of the chairs know, and, and you can plug into the WebEx when it takes place, as long as you're willing to stay up that late or, or go to bed that early. Um, we are making progress. We, we're actually getting a lot more participation now from the hydrographic offices themselves. Initially, there was only about eight HOs were actually interested in this and working on this. And then we started developing this publication, uh, C17, which is an official publication of the IHO. And you can download that from the, from the student site, uh, which took about three years to get through draft stage and then reached a point where it could be released in January last year. Virtually no wording was changed in the last two years, but like any other convention-based international organization, everything has to be agreed by all the members, or nearly all the members, and usually through two or three different procedures. So we finally got agreement to release it. Now, privately, we've been sending this out to everybody we know ever since the final draft was done, but we weren't allowed to do that publicly. <clears throat> and there's a lot of good information there on the background for SDI, the economic drivers for SDI, why hydro hydrographic offices should be involved, what uh, the crowdsourcing aspect, the benefits to users. So it's a really good basic document, and it is an official publication on marine SDI. I think it's the only official publication on marine SDI from an international organization.
and it's being updated as well. Part of the working group activity that we do, I'm working on the new data policy section, trying to get all the data policies together. That will become a new chapter in the revised version of this, probably 2020, I imagine. We'll submit it next year, and it'll take till 2020 before it's published. Um, and we also interact closely with the new uh, standards working group, which is a different working group at IHO on the S100 standard which I'll say something about a bit later. Here's a quick, just a quick table of contents of the C17 publication, which say you can, you can download from the, from the student website. So a couple of key items there are the important drivers, the business planning, and the challenges. So you've got a really good introduction to it. This has been through about five edits, this, this, this document, including input from industry uh, and from the experts, not just from the hydrographic offices. And the annexes are, are, again, you've got the SDI best practice, uh, data policy, fundamentals of what should be in a marine SDI, um, how to engage with the SDI, how to get the stakeholders involved, and looking at SDI business plans. So in one sense, the, the annexes are, is, is important or more important than the actual text itself. If you get involved in trying to engage with your, uh, your, your states, your, your organizations, or your countries on what should we do about coastal marine SDI. Now, the new S100 Marine Standards, up until now, the main standard for the hydrographic offices was S57. It has to do with safe navigation at sea, SOLAS. And it all had to do with collecting data you know, by survey vessels, um, official data to official standards, and then publishing it to, to update the charts, <clears throat> and then the electronic charts. Fine. But we realized at least three years ago now that these ships are out there. They cost $50,000 a day, 50,000 euro a day or more to operate. They're collecting a lot of data, most of which is just thrown away because it doesn't have anything to do specifically with bathymetric uh, recording under the S57 standard. So it was decided to come up with a new set of standards, a new framework, which would be based on the ISO 1900 series of geospatial standards, which everyone is adopting in their SDIs globally, to start keeping this data and using something, you know, using it on an official basis. So because it's being collected by a hydrographic office research vessel, a survey vessel, it's considered official data, and it's being published to a standard, which makes it official, and you'll be able to get access to it. Um, and the, the, the supporting initial documents supporting S100 explained why they wanted you know, this, this to be developed to give the hydrographic offices a new role. You know, they don't actually have to do much extra work. It's not, in, it's not in data collection. It's already being collected, but they have to process it a bit better afterwards rather than throw it away or ignore it. Um, it's based on the S100 data stack. So all of these little blocks that are lying flat there are existing ISO S100, uh, uh, ISO, was it, 1900 series standards, which came out, mainly came out of the Open Geospatial Consortium and then became ISO standards. The key element here is when an S100 standard is developed, which, feed, which is fed into by the various um, ISO standards, you have to have a registry. You need one official place you can go to to find out the information about what exists. Not metadata about, meta, about data, but metadata about uh, whole data sets, about tools, about standards. And IHO does have the official registry. It maintains the official registry for the marine S100 standards. This is the sort of thing that is going to be developed in the series. The series right now is called the S110, S100 to S199 series. We've only developed three so far that we're still working on because it's all being done on a, on a user-driven basis. And obviously, the first one that was done, uh, we'll get that in a minute. I'll say now, the first one that was done was bathymetry. What have I done now? Was bathymetry because uh, S102, because everybody's, uh, this is key to the hydrographic office work. We've now developed a, a, a draft, which is in its really final stages for maritime limits and boundaries. That's been, uh, that was presented over a year ago at a, a big meeting in, in Southampton in the UK. They're now working on the under keel clearance management. But you see the XXs, there's still a lot of, well, we could do this, we could do that, we could develop this one. So first of all, they have to vote through the Standards Committee on which one they'll work on next. Then they have to find the people who want to work on that standard, and then they have to start doing the standards development, and then they have to get it agreed, right, to become an official S100 standard for IHO. So it's a long process. And it's starting, but it's still a long process. Um, so 
101 electric nautical charts, electronic nautical charts. You can download the draft specification here. <clears throat> I don't think it's going to change much. Bathymetric service uh, exists. I think it's still called the draft only because it hasn't been voted on yet. And maritime limits and boundaries, the draft that exists that you can get online exists, and I don't think it's going to be changed. I mean, when it was presented to us in September last year at uh, Southampton, um, basically the project leaders, Canadian organizations, said, you know, they don't expect any more changes to take place. But then I had the long debate with him, well, how does this relate to my vision of marine cadaster? Is it just the boundary? It's the whole water column. It's the water volume. It's all the different things taking place in that volume. And he says, well, that is still missing. And they understand that. And it's something they will have to do. <clears throat> but rather than come up with a new standard on uh, you know, marine cadaster, they will probably focus on expanding this one so that the boundaries actually then take in use of the water column as well, or more, st more information about the water column. We'll see. So this is just a quick example of, uh, of how, you know, how it develops the limits and boundaries. You've got typical data sets. You've got the territorial sea, the contiguous sea, the economic zone, the extended continental shelf, blah, blah, blah. Fine. You develop a standard. Then you have to develop. <laughs> then it's up to the, to the member states or the countries to actually decide where the boundaries should go. And if you want to talk to Japan and China or even a couple, I think, in, in the Mediterranean, this becomes an issue. I remember when I was working with the, with the digital, uh, Data Information Knowledge Exchange Group for implementing the Maritime Spatial Planning Directive, or the Maritime Strategy Framework, we had 18 months discussing boundaries. This is just European member states who have coastal regions. And three times, this, the EEA was in charge of this part of the activity, and three times they all came down. We had 60 people in the room up in Brussels. We're all saying, yes, and here it is. And then a hand would go up from Malta, or a hand would go up from Portugal over the Canary said, no, we, we can't agree to this. And this one meeting, this poor lady from the AEA just went <coughs> and just bashed her head on the keyboard and said, OK, we'll start again. 18 months to agree the boundaries for reporting good environmental status. Nothing, I mean, that, and that was this much, because the whole concept of reporting good environmental status had to be what do we collect and, and the grid surface and all this stuff. They couldn't even agree the boundaries for reporting between two states. It's still an issue. They've resolved it now. They had to because of the directive, but it took a long time. Uh, quickly on the OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium has been around, what, 24 years now? Done tremendous work in the geospatial community. A lot of what we started off with, with SDI back in, you say, 1999, 90, uh, 2000, 2001, we just didn't have standards. In those days, you could list the OGC data specifications that were being developed on a single A4 sheet on a single PowerPoint slide. It would take me about four slides now to just show you the list, the names of the different specifications they've worked on over the last 15 years. And many of those have now become ISO standards. Basically, ISO doesn't adopt the, the geospatial standards anymore. They come out of OGC or maybe some national committees, and then they're adopted as ISO standards uh, for global representation. Um, they have 39 domain working groups within the OGC. It's got 527 members now, I think. I'm a private member. You can be a private member. You can be a government member, an academic member, a uh, research institute member. If you're what they call a strategic member, it's $55,000 a year membership. One's only 500, but for $55,000 a year, and there's about, I don't know, 10 or 15 strategic members, more than that, they actually help direct what standards are going to be developed next. And, and if you're a member, any level of member, because there's lots of different levels of membership, then you can participate in the, in the development process and have your stay on, on the standard if you want to. Uh, my only interest has ever really been in, in the Marine side with them. So I only became a member two years ago when we formed the, domain, the Marine Domain Working Group. But the good thing is, they, everything is free. Everything is totally open. They don't charge for any of their activity. The minute it becomes an ISO standard, you have to pay for it, because ISO standards are not free <coughs> in most places. Um, in fact, probably not free anywhere under the agreement. You go to Geneva to the website, and it'll be 27 euro or 28 euro or 32 euro, because a lot of the standards bodies still charge for their national standards. UK certainly does. So. It helps to, again, to belong to some of these groups if you're interested in that level of where activity because you get uh, reasonable access to it. Again, we, so we work closely with the Marine, uh, um, the IHO Marine SDI working group. Essentially, OGC's role, because it develops standards and specifications, is to get people involved. 
you've got these 520 some members from around the globe, all different levels of participation. And they, after they create new standards, before it's finally accepted, they call them specifications, they develop uh, interoperability tests. So you have like Hack of Hackfest, where 10 or 15 organizations get together, and they've got two days to actually apply this new specification in real life situations, sitting in a room using data sets and developing applications. And if it gets through the interoperability test, then they learn from that. They might tweak the standard a bit, and then eventually it becomes adopted as an OGC standard. So there is still a, a test process in there. Um, I sat on the, the, I was an ISO, a commission rep at ISO for about five years in Geneva, and so many people there had never even read the standards they agreed to. They were sent to Geneva to say, yep, we accept this standard. And the same thing was happening in the UK when I was on the BSI standards committee for SDI standard. Um, we had two or three guys on the committee out of 12 people who would actually read the standard, comment on it, and edit it, and other people would show up for the meeting to vote. They hadn't even read it yet. But they said, well, if Ralph says it's okay, it must be okay. And they would just agree the standard. And it becomes a new national standard. And I'm sure that's probably the case in a lot of standards bodies. We'll see. So basically, Marine Data Working Group, which anybody can join, you don't have to be an OGC member, is a way to keep involved, to keep yourself informed, and to feed back into them to see if they're doing something of any use to you. So are we getting near the end? I hope so, yeah. Some good practices. Um, your coastal, this is sort of a, a sum up. Your coastal SDI needs to exist within your national SDI, right? You can't do it in isolation anymore because everybody is now implementing an SDI under the National Information Policy. But you have to make the marine community aware that they need to participate. Otherwise, it is still very much driven by the topographic community, the agricultural community, the, the forestry people. It's people who work on land because all you people who work in the sea, you, you know, they never heard of you before. So you know, you're off in a boat somewhere, or, you're, or your coast is being flooded. So you've got to get involved in these organizations. And then identify a key organization or a small group of organizations to be the leader. As we saw in the Irish Spatial Data Exchange, it was five agencies. You know, people knew people. They got together. They agreed something had to be done. The Marine Institute basically took the administrative lead, and things started to happen. But until that happens, nothing happens. <clears throat> and also, in this, this uh, try to get embedded into your e-government activities, your, your part of your national information infrastructure, because all of your government agencies are going to be required to participate in e-government in the first place. When we were in Namibia, the last day I was there on my consulting, my three and a half week consulting visit before we developed the final strategy, we were invited to a meeting that was being held at cabinet level by the by the prime minister. Um, and there were about 25 people in the room, and they were just about to finalize the standards for e-government for Namibia. And they were really dynamic about this. And none of the topographic mapping people had even heard about this. They didn't have a single representative on the system. Uh, the National Standard Statistical Office, NSA, who are the driving force, who are the legal uh, driver force for the SDI in Namibia, they'd never, they'd never been invited to one of these meetings. Fortunately, because I was there as a consultant, they decided to invite, us to invite us to the meeting. And we immediately then made contact with them and said, don't finalize anything until you know, we've liaised with you. This is your national statistical agency. It's implementing the spatial data infrastructure for Namibia, which covers every type of data you've got. And you were going to go do something by yourself to not tell us. So it's a matter of getting the word around. You need, you need to, to communicate. Always use international standards. They, the problem with that is it now says in most, a lot of SDI strategies, uh, you will use international standards. It never says what international standards. Even the directives, the, the new directive from uh, access to public sector information from the EU 2013 <coughs> just says you will publish this information using international standards. Now, you're safe in one sense because if you start to quote a standard and then it changes five years later, that because standards change, that doesn't help, but a bit more direction on which international standards you might be using, at least by group or type or whatever, would help. And be ready to, to adapt to change, because nothing stands still. Even the work we did uh, 2015, July, August, September, Namibia, uh, last month, I learned some of that has already changed now. Different people are involved, different agencies have taken leads in different aspects. Uh, they've, they've got much better technology than they had before because the government agreed to give the NSA more budget to buy new computers. Everything changes. Now, you're doing marine spatial planning tomorrow, yes, I think? So I'll just do 
I'll just do very quickly, just to show. The problem with MSP, marine spatial planning, and marine cadaster, is the multiple themes. Um, it's, just, you know, it's similar to the coastal area, where you have lots of different themes involved, but in a bigger case. So it's hard to, to get the right people together to do something. Uh, even in the Marine uh, Spatial Planning Directive, 2014, basically it says this is the process. Um, member states shall take into account the land-sea interactions, so it requires you to take account of land-sea interactions. Similar executive order in, uh, in the states, uh, 2005. Um, it actually states in the, in the document, in the, mar in the marine environment, the terminology of, of cadaster is still unclear because there are problems like discontinuity between land and marine cadastres, standards, etc. One of the things, this was 2002, <clears throat> one of the things that came out in the uh, marine cadaster study, which you can download from, from the project website, is exactly the same thing today. When you talk to some people, marine cadaster means marine spatial planning, when that's not what marine cadaster means. Marine cadaster is a bit like land cadaster, just finding out where things are. It doesn't necessarily involve the planning process. Um, but if you sit down with, with especially funders for new projects, you need to understand that you're using this, the same definitions and the same terminology. So here's some problems. The people that did this research worked with a UN organization, a European-wide organization, and three national organizations, mainly in land cadaster. Right? It's, the, it's the UNECE's cadaster group. But they also have marine connections. You know, they work with the marine community. And the first thing they find is the concept of tenure, of owning a piece of land in a land cadaster, uh, doesn't exist at sea or exist in a different way. I mean, nobody owns this piece of the ocean. They may own exploration rights here. Somebody else may own fishery rights here. Somebody else may own some other right, laying underground pipeline rights. But you don't just own the piece of land. And you've got these things where ocean doesn't stand still very much. It tends to move around a lot. So even after you've done your boundaries, when it comes to use of that 3D volume, that 4D volume, it becomes much more complicated to do marine cadaster, which is probably why nobody's really done it yet. Um, you can't use the classical marine, uh, means of demarcation of a land, you know, a land parcel, which is in every land cadaster. For example, on the coast. Where's the coastline? Which coastline are we talking about? You want mean high tide, mean low tide, low tide? There are 27. In the UK, we found 27 officially recognized definitions of the coastline, depending on whether it was federal, whether it was a county, whether it was used for a you know, fishery purpose or an urban planning purpose. 27 legal definitions of what the coastline was. So you've got a real problem there with a the marine cadaster site as well. Maybe you need a marine cadaster that has all 27 in. I don't know. Uh, the marine environment is three-dimensional and actually four-dimensional because of the, the time, you know, the movement of water flow. You've got, you've got the problem with overlapping rights, as I just said. You've got a piece of, piece of ocean that's got exploration rights, pipeline rights, fishing rights, maybe tourism rights, uh, uh, protection rights, so on a single piece of ocean. And the rights vary over time. Exploration licenses only last two years or one year, and then they disappear. And other rights in that area. Fishery rights are closed parts of the year. You can fish here these six months. You can't fish here these six months. So somehow that time element has to be brought in, which doesn't exist in, in normal land cadastre. Um, and then the baseline. Again, you know, where are the maritime boundaries? Maritime boundaries, this is ambulatory. In other words, it has to do with the coastline moving around as well. So it should be considered as part of the spatial data infrastructure. Um, and then the spatial data can be more easily accessed to get the basic dynamic information. Land, almost no SDI work, land-based SDI, has brought in the dynamic issue. In fact, in the early days of development of SDI, back in 1999 to 2002 or 3, nobody ever considered weather. There wasn't a single meteorological organization invited along to the standards bodies who were developing standards. They were OGC. They were all two-dimensional standards. And uh, we finally had a big meeting up at the University of Edinburgh, and the Met Office came, uh, the French Met Office came. They said, well, that's great, but what about air volumes that move? This is what we need. Oh, yeah, we never thought about that. So then they started putting in 3D, at least, and trying to capture 4D in the new, in the new data specifications. Um, the ju jurisdictional problem. Who's, who's responsible for the coastline, or who's responsible for the offshore activity? And the U.S. Uh, Office of Coastal Management, we saw these contributing partners. Some of these are official bodies. 
Uh, a lot of these are private bodies. The, fed, the federal bodies, they do have to have you know, federal boundaries, et cetera, for marine exploration. But nobody is really in charge, except in this case, the Office for Coastal Management, in a coordinating role, right? And they have to be properly funded to do this as well. Um, but this then brought in this concept of non-authoritative non data, the trusted data, from marinecadaster.gov. They have a well-developed marine cadaster sort of subsystem. <clears throat> it's a multi, they call it a multi-purpose platform marine cadaster. You can go to that website and have a look. And it's tried to bring in all the different data themes that you need to look at marine cadaster using the other data that already exists as part of the SDI or the, or the coastal SDI. And that's probably one of the more advanced that I've seen. I certainly was the most advanced they found in the study they did back in 2014. You're going to see these marine spatial planning themes probably tomorrow. You can see, obviously, they're all marine. <clears throat> this is the multi-purpose cadaster on the left-hand side. So the sort of themes that they bring together and who has responsibility. And then on the right side, I just plotted the uh, marine spatial planning themes that are in the directive. So you can see that there is obviously a lot of crossover, a lot of uh, matching up. It's always good to see what somebody else has done if they're five years ahead of you uh, rather than start from scratch. And you take on board what suits you and you, you ignore what doesn't. Uh, maritime policy has no legal basis. This is only for the Europeans here. The Treaty of Rome governs everything that the EU does. When we develop a new communication at the European Commission, when I worked for them for 10 years, or a new directive, it has to have a little tagline somewhere in the Treaty of Rome that formed the EU before you could actually go ahead with the work. And it's interesting because nobody thought about maritime policy back in 1954 or whenever it was. There is no explicit legal basis in the Treaty of Rome for developing things like the Marine Strategy Framework Directive or the Marine Spatial Planning Directive. But they were able to get it through, right? Because they realize how important it is now. And then directives are promulgated, accepted by the Council, by Parliament, and they have to be passed into international law, into law at national states. So the Inspired Directive had to be legally adopted by every member state in a statute, a, you know, a, regula um, a law, which they all did. Um, hi, we, we accept the directive. But it didn't do much beyond that. The EC regulations that are developed to implement the directive, and we have at least five now or six altogether for, just for Inspire, they become law the minute they're published in the official journal of the European Union. No member state passes a law to how to implement the metadata for Inspire. The regulation exists. You have to do it. And if you don't do it, then they can take you to the court of justice and actually fine you. And it is a real process. Um, I know on the Birds Directive, Protection of Birds Directive 2000, about 10 years later, so many countries, I won't name which country it was, <coughs> quite a big country um, in Europe, was not implementing the Birds Directive properly, the Protection of Birds Directive. And they finally reached the point where they were going to be fined 410 million euro because they'd been warned three times, three years each, do this now. And each time they would put another 50 birds under, the, under their national statute, but they would leave out another 150 birds. And when it finally reached the point where they were going to be fined 410 million euro, guess what? All birds were suddenly covered by the directive of this unnamed European country. So then they didn't have to pay the fine. So in cases where they don't adhere, Britain had to pay a fine for not implementing the agricultural payments uh, directive that came out for the common agricultural policy. They were fined 187 million pounds, 200 million pounds, and they had to pay it because they still hadn't implemented the online system that was required by the directive to implement payments to farmers. So DEFRA, the Department of Environment, Food, Agricultural Affairs, they had to pay 187 million pounds to the, to the EU, which then they just took out of the budget for next year, so the system still wasn't implemented. So sometimes the finding doesn't work. So they have a real stick and carrot system here. Um, we won't go into that now because we don't need it. We've got the marine data challenges. This came out of the, this, this shows a way in a sense how the um, marine community, because everything on the left is from the marine GDI, this is Canadian marine GDI, feeds into, can feed into cadastral data along with the habitat, seismic hydrography, and, and bathymetric data. So <clears throat> there's a lot of work already there to build a marine cadaster. And that was also what they found in the study that, that they did uh, in 2014 and 15. But somebody has to decide to do it and champion the doing it and then start getting it done. 
It's not like we're starting all over. Oh, no, tomorrow we have to build a marine SDI. It's going to take years. Well, it may take years, but most of the data is probably already there and hopefully harmonized. The problem with marine spatial planning is it requires a lot more data from a lot more data uh, sources, and there are lots of different types of sources with different rights to the data than in a lot of other applications. I mean, even on land, you've got you know, urban planning is, is similar in one sense, but urban planning has been around for so long, and it, it has been you know, university degrees at major universities everywhere, how to do urban planning. I did one at MIT in 1974, 75. So there's a lot of experience there with bringing data sources together. And these, these land-based units, certainly in urban areas, are used to working together. In the marine community, it's, it's more difficult. But how can you plan anything without knowing what the boundaries are? Which is why at least getting the boundaries agreed is right even implementing the uh, good environmental status and the strategy framework directive. If you can't do the boundaries, then people aren't going to report properly because it's supposed to be a standardized reporting system. And everything at the land and sea interface is, is more complicated than either land or sea. And we used to call, there we had workshops 2003 onwards. Uh, the British Geological Survey had a marine unit, very small marine unit. They called it the White Ribbon. So whenever you looked at a map, you had this highly detailed ordnance survey map coming up to the coast, and then you had highly detailed information from Admiralty PLC, from the Hydrographic Office, and there was this white ribbon which had no data on it because nobody quite knew how to collect the data or which data you're reporting, and the boundary moves every day. So they called it filling in the white ribbon, and we started working on activities to do the land-sea merging of data as far back as 2003. And there is actually a process now in place. There are a there's a company that does this under contract. It's very labor intensive. It requires, even with artificial intelligence, it requires people sitting there with two big screens in front of them, looking at the at the OS data, for example, and the hydraulic uh, the hydrographic office data, and where things don't match, finally finding a way, discussing things with people to get things to match up. So they end up with a unified database. They estimated the cost to do that. This was five, six years ago. The cost to do that just for the coastline in Britain was 188 million pounds. So they haven't done it. They do bits of it. So Isle of Wight is covered. I think Kent County Council has paid for their bit. So it's a, a commercial company, so you have to pay for it. Uh, OK, the Marine Cadastres Report you can download from the site. I've just got a, a little bit here on the. They, they looked at uh, 28 member states, 19 conducted the survey, 13 member states replied that they had some kind of marine information system, some kind of marine information system. None of them claimed to have a cadaster or fully implemented marine information system. Some are more well advanced than others. Denmark, Germany, France, they've done a lot of work in this area. Others are sort of thinking about it or it's still at a, at a pilot stage. <clears throat> The real problem is the lack of real marine cadastral registration component right, in the projects that are underway right now. So they've had activities looking at marine information systems, maritime information systems, but they're still not really looking at the marine cadastral re registra registration issues within that system. Again, some of these they couldn't even agree on what was the definition of a marine cadaster. Marine cadaster is not spatial planning. I already said that. Uh, MSP is a process. The process itself is as important as anything you end up with in the plan. It's getting the people together, understanding different problems, understanding different issues. Um, but again, there is no reference to the notion of a marine cadaster in the EU's marine maritime regulatory framework because marine cadaster is still that new in one sense in people's minds, even though marine cadaster work has been going on for 20 years in some, of the, in some other countries. So now it's time for your homework. I got close. I got close. Um, you'll find these. No, I have these here. I was going to hand out paper, but that's stupid. <laughs> so I'm leaving at 3.30 to go to England to run another conference. <coughs> We've got four pieces of information here. The first is called the FUD test, the data FUD test. What's FUD? FUD is a marketing technique used by IBM computer sales within the 50s. It's called fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So you show up at a client site, potential client site, and you scare the pants off him. If he doesn't buy an IBM computer, his business is going to go under next week. And he becomes quite uncertain about that and raises doubts in the minds of his management. So it became known as the FUD management technique. I started adopting that 
18 years ago on collecting data about SDI. Because people were afraid of the topic. They were afraid of how much work it was going to do. But all this one is, it's a little, it's what, nine questions, ten questions, which I will ask you to, to download the doc, which is on the, the website, <coughs> on the course site. Sorry? Oh, okay. I thought it was. No, it is. She put the word, she put the doc versions up. I don't, well, they were on the, they were on, if you look at the, at the course outline for my module, the doc versions are there now. I had PDFs before. It's hard to fill out a PDF online unless it's an it's a, uh, interactive PDF, and I hate those. So I put down the doc versions as well. So basically what, I'm going to, what I would like to do um, with the, the FUD test, forget the fear, uncertainty, and doubt part. It's do you know your data? This is the other bit. Answer this as fully as you can. And you don't have to identify yourself, so don't feel embarrassed. So you can be really honest. And then I'd like you to send it back to me or, or to Claudia. Because we're I've been collecting these for 17 years. I've got a, about 250 of these now at meetings like this with what I call practitioners, people who have to do the work. What do they really know or don't know? Or what do they need to know? Or what are they worried about? So we can feed that back into research papers and documents to, to bring up to other levels of management. Otherwise, somebody comes along and says, we're going to do an SDI. Here's the plan. Go do it. You know? And they haven't thought about the sort of things that these questions ask. Um, the second short document, one page, it's called the Marine SDI Best Practice Document. Essentially, I've listed the main components for an SDI. Now, I used to do this. I would hand it out at the beginning of a workshop, have people fill it out, and then we'd do the whole SDI presentation for three hours and then fill it out again at the end to see how much their perception had changed. It's asking you to rank, to rate, different aspects of an SDI component in, in orders of importance. And you've only got most important, important, least important, and not important for about nine or ten categories. So obviously you can use some more than once. Uh, things like spatial data, metadata, the services, the technologies, the data policies, the legal agreements, institutional arrangements, financial issues, monitoring reporting requirements. How do you rate these? These are all components of an SDI. They have to exist for your SDI. So just from your point of view, from the sort of work you do, how do you rate these in order of importance? And then there's four quick questions at the end, just to get a bit of information about the person filling out the form. You know, are you from academia or government? Uh, have you ever been involved in SDI before? Does your government have an SDI policy or, or your organization? Because SDI policies start at the organizational level, usually within a, a national umbrella. So that's another one that shouldn't take you too long to do. It's just how you see things. <coughs> The third one is something you need to think about, so you can't do it today. Um, it's what I call the SDI Readiness Index Calculator. And for this, read MSDI. It's SDI. We use this when we're implementing a strategy in countries. The first thing we do, I went to Turkey, and Namibia, Egypt. You show up, you have workshops with different people, and you sit down with them, and you work through this readiness calculator. And it's asking you questions about um, understanding the, your spatial data holdings. Um, do you have a vision? Does your government have a vision for the SDI? Is there a legal document, a statement stating what the SDI should be? Um, have they developed a strategy to implement that? Are there policies in force? Are there regulations in force? Um, what level is the IT at? I mean, do you have enough IT? Do you need more training, in, in your opinion? from what you know, working in your own group, um, is sufficient data available for you to do your job you know, and to re relate to other people? These are just yes, no's. There's a lot of, it's not just a list of the questions and yes, no. There's a, a bulb on the right that says, this is what I'm, the sort of information I'd like you to think about. And again, it's from your point of view. Just think about this. Um, when we use this in government scenes, they've usually had to take this away and go in because we want these view from the whole of the SDI, all the government agencies. So they take it away, and then they have their own little workshops, and they sit around, and, and you know, some, some are better prepared than others, and we get a different level of answers. So after you've been through that exercise of going through the, the readiness index, and there are several versions of this available as well in the literature, then how to assess what you need or even assess how successful it's been, then you have a starting point for doing the planning and the policy implementation and all the rest of it.
because <clears throat> a lot of these questions on here, and I'm talking direct experience in six, seven countries now, implementing SDI at national level, people never even thought of some of these things. The first thing they jump into is let's do a portal and let's have some standards. They understand that. Let's have metadata standards, data standards. We'll try to harmonize the data and let's have portals. And those are all very important things. But there's lots of other things you have to consider as well. And the last um, document, which you can't, there's a PDF on the system. I don't have a, I don't have a word version of this because we're not supposed to use it, I guess. The data accessibility benchmark organizational self-assessment tool, which was developed by Coleman Atlantic uh, on the Atlantic uh, coast of Canada uh, and is still being updated from time to time. It's one that they used when they approached the maritime community and the coastal states of Canada, the maritime provinces, to start to <coughs> understand how, how well their own organizations are ready you know, to use data in, in the format that would be good for an SDI. And it's, uh, it's several pages. Um, we're still changing some of the questions because we'll, we've used this at two Coast GIS conferences. A couple of the questions were still a little bit ambiguous, so we had to, we had to change the wording. <coughs> but think of it as a, as a self-help thing. Um, and if you get involved in developing SDI uh, in, your, in your countries or even in your organization, it's the sort of thing you need to, to submit to have people to think about. And the last one, which isn't part of your group of your work, is this uh, IHO SDI questionnaire. The Canadian Hydrographic Office developed a detailed questionnaire, about eight or nine pages long, to go out to the hydrographic offices to find out what state they were in. Because again, when we first started the Marine SDI, the hydrographic offices, we had about eight coming to the meetings and 10 or 12 were interested out of 120 hydrographic offices. So. Um, the head of the hydrographic service, who's now left, she works somewhere else, she developed this questionnaire, uh, which became an IHO questionnaire, to send to all the HOs to then start collecting information on where are we, you know, what, do we what do we think about marine SDI, how are we going to participate, as part of the, the C-17 document that we had published in draft format, which they all had access to even before it became an official publication. Um, now there is, um, I don't have a report, well I have a report of the of how far they got with this and by this was in 2015 by 2017 but this is still sort of internal to the Marine SDI working group at IHO but there is a presentation that has all the results, a summary of all the results which is probably more important anyway and I think that's listed, the URL for that or the report itself is on the, the course list if you looked at the course list. Um, that's the one that says I forget what it says because I haven't got it in front of me. So again, that's something else for your own, your own use, your own knowledge, your own background in working on SDI. Now, I was going to ask you to go home tonight and develop an SDI uh, to present tomorrow in, in five minutes or less in only two sheets of paper, like you were making a business, the, the elevator presentation, right? Uh, but Greg says I can't do that. Uh, I'm not allowed to take away 12 hours of sleeping time for you to come up with a basic idea of how you would go about it, let alone do it. The main lesson is that it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of coordination, it takes funding, it takes a lot of time, you're talking years. Even if you have an SDI pretty well in place following international standards, a national SDI, to then weld all those components that need to be have a, a more marine focus is going to take another two or three years on top of that. Mainly just getting all the stakeholders together that you need to get together. What issues are they trying to solve? What problems are they trying to solve? Where if we had better joined up access to multiple databases across multiple disciplines, they could do their job more effectively, more efficiently, they'd have cost savings, they'd have better benefits. So there's a lot of human participation that has to take place in this. And that's up to young people like you. Us 70-year-old old guys, we've done it all now, so we don't care anymore. And fortunately, I don't have time for questions, but there is still three minutes left officially. <laughs> no? <laughs> no, 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 not from the... <laughs> the question is, would you like them to send them back to you? 
Well, on, on two of the forums, I've actually said at the bottom, send it to my email address. On the other one, I just said, send it to the group leader, the course, send it to, to Claudia, or send it to both of us. I don't care, but uh, just so long as we get it. The ones I've said, send it back to me, is because I'm actually using these as input to this research that we're doing. So I'd appreciate it. And I'll share it with Claudia as well at the end. You don't, again, on none of these do you have to identify yourself. It's, I'm not asking for personal information. I'm just, I might ask what organization, what type of organization you're from, and things like that. Yes? Hi. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, where I was from, um, we had spent a lot of time, if you, if you recall in your first question, I was one of the only persons who was involved, who was involved in the NSDI. We had spent a lot of time developing an NSDI for the entire country. Um, unfortunately, and I think this is one of the points to consider as well in, in how challenging it could be, um, we had developed a pretty comprehensive NSDI considering a lot of the principles that you outlined, um, such that even it was controlled at the central government level, so pretty much every government funded project that had a spatial uh, component to it had to abide by certain regulations that the NSD, NSDC, which is the council, would have set out. So pretty much to get funding, you had to abide by these principles, mm -hmm. and all your data had to come back in. So all the standards would have been set at that mm -hmm. level as well. Unfortunately, just as that council was up and ready to go, government changed. Mm. So the politics of it, I think, is really is a really important point. Well, that's why I say you have to adapt to change, <laughs> and most of the really I say some of the really big problems are organizational problems. Um, you're not alone. When we were doing the the strategy for Turkey. Turkish law had been in effect for a few years, <clears throat> and I was hired out there as the external expert to work with the, uh, with the government contractor who was then charged, let's do the strategy. Um, we did the strategy. We had a huge meeting. 120 government departments got together at this huge, beautiful resort uh, in the south of, on the coast, and, and we had a great time and, and agreed lots of things. Um, the one thing we didn't agree by the time that week was over was who's going to be in charge. That was number one. And then there was change in government as well. Um, almost three years went by before anything of any substance happened. You know, they actually were still trying to work with standards. You know, the standards, the national standards body was involved in the process. They came to the meeting. Um, but they weren't going to spend any money or, or any extra time and resources until they had a firm, you know, legal framework to work within. And when you have this sort of change taking place, it isn't surprising that people don't participate. Either they don't want to do it twice or it loses priority. So I don't know how you, I guess the only way you can work away from that in a sense is if you're working in a community like the coastal community or just a, type, a part of the marine community. You can keep your activities going as long as they aren't costing too much and aren't too top heavy so that the, the word is kept alive, the concept is kept alive. Because what happened in Turkey was for almost three years just you know, nobody knew what to do, so nobody cared anymore. Two or three research papers were published by universities, and that was about it. But then after they, they created this cabinet-level post for SDI, then things started to happen again, because you couldn't have the infighting anymore. You probably still had the infighting between departments, but there was somebody who was responsible to the prime minister, you know, the president, the, the council, to actually get things done. In Europe, we're not supposed to have that problem. We have Inspire. So everything is going beautifully over here. I think only nine or ten countries have been fined so far for not implementing Inspire or are being considered for, fine, for being fined. Because it's one thing even to have an EC regulation that says you must do this. But if you don't have the money to do it, you don't do it because you don't have the money. I think what, what I guess one thing, one lesson we've learned in Inspire is it was too prescriptive. The EC regulation on how you should actually have your data harmonized. And we're talking about across 34 data themes, which actually covered about 64 sub-themes altogether. They had to develop this, the specification for exactly what your database attribute names would be in 22 languages and how you would implement. You would take your own database and then you do a schema translator and put your working database into an Aspire format. Because every real-world database had more data in it than the Inspire specification required. It was the lowest common denominator type thing. 
you might have you know, 40 data attributes in the database you use for your everyday job, but the actual Inspire compliant database only had 23. So you had to find a way to move the appropriate 23 from your data set into this new Inspire compliant data set using the new specification. It had to have exactly the same attribute name as existed in the regulation. It was the biggest regulation they've ever printed when it came out. The first one came out in 2011, 10 or 11, for, even for the metadata, certainly for the data. It was the biggest EC regulation they'd ever printed as far as volume went. It was 187 pages in English, 210 pages in French, and 215 in German, because they were every data theme, every annex, every item, it had to be done this way. And then they were developing the tools to help you do that. So you could take your data set, feed it into the schema translator, and an Inspire compliant data set would come out the other end. And that was the theory. The problem was, sometimes you had two data items that actually met in, merged into one data item over here in the Inspire schema. So how did you do that? Or you might have one data item, which was more all-encompassing, one attribute, than, say, two in the other one. So it still involved a lot of some human intervention to actually do the change. And then the directive also said you have to create an Aspire compliant data set. It didn't say how often you had to update it. It didn't say how often you had to actually manage it. <coughs> so some states were saying, fine, Ireland, here's my um, history. And they had to be only for legally mandated data sets. So I'm in charge of, of monuments, protecting ancient monuments. I have two data sets. Um, they do change from time to time, but here it is, October 2015. I've now made an Aspire compliant copy of my two data sets. There it is. It's on the internet. It's on the website. Go access it. But the next 15 changes I make to my data set, I didn't really have to put into my Aspire compliant data set yet. You do eventually. You are supposed to keep up, but in the early days, it wasn't required. So again, you were fulfilling the directive, you were fulfilling the regulation, but you still had to be careful when you accessed at a European-wide basis, if you were trying to do a, a study on how people manage ancient monuments around Europe, you know, every country has something along those lines, you'd have to be careful on, on how you use the data that you access. Later, when something like the Public Sector Information Directive came out, which requires every government body in the EU to make available their public sector information, even though it doesn't have to be for free, but you have to make it available. It has to be discoverable. And the original directive in 2003, uh, Article 9, I called it the do something article. It set out all the provisions as to why it's a good thing to do, and, you have a, and then it had two sentences, you will do something. You know, you will make this information available somehow. And when we did the 10-year review of that directive and came up with the amended directive in 2013, it says, oh, by the way, here is what you will do. You will create metadata to international standards. It will be publishable on the Internet. It will be discoverable on the Internet, blah, blah, blah. So, but they didn't go any further than that. And I mean, I guess the, the whole concept of what is public sector information, it covers everything produced in, in the public sector. You couldn't make it any more specific than that than you needed to. So, and everybody just assumed that when they say use international standard, they're either using the ISO you know, standard for Dublin Core um, or the ISO metadata standard for location data. As long as you used an international standard where you could find out what that standard was, if you wanted to access it, then it was okay. A lot of people now who are trying to implement Inspire, a lot of people at the European Commission who were directly involved in Inspire from the beginning wish they'd done something else now. Uh, but it's law, so they keep plugging away. Coffee time.